he is a very good mathematician, and uh, he's very dedicated to what he does, and he do that really well. Sometimes he forget to eat. <laughs>
for so I cannot be Newton. <laughs> I cannot I cannot forget to eat. I cannot avoid meals to be able to do more. I don't encourage you guys to do that. But uh, uh, what I noticed is that a lot of kids, young age, four year old, five year old, when they get focused, uh, they forget to eat. So maybe younger generations like you guys, you have the potential to discover more. That's for Newton. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about another story later today that's about uh, younger generations do better. Another important figure in modeling history uh, is Faraday. He invented the uh, Faraday's law, which lead to electronic motors, which is what we use a lot in mechanical systems. He had no schooling at the early age at all, but he read a lot of books himself, and he self-taught himself, and then he had access to a lot of books uh, when he was working at a young age. All right. That's the history. And uh, most of the things that uh, Newton's law deal with, if you think about it, is building from the physical concepts, right? So I look at uh, how acceleration translates to speed, and then how a moving mass uh, can, can respond to a force, to a shock, etc. So many of the modeling that we do is based on physics. Right. I use fundamental engineering principles, such as Newton's law, the conservation of energy, to build these models. The temperature control example, uh, they use the energy conservation inside the house, the thermal energy conservation inside the house to build the model. That's the focus of this course. Modeling can also be based on data. So sometimes the system that we deal with, uh, they are just impossible to be able to list out all these parameters and know these values of the parameters precisely. So in a lot of applications, we actually have to be doing things a little bit differently. We would sort of do some testing to the system. It's like doing interviews to, to, to a person. We ask a bunch of questions, and then we can understand how he thinks through his responses. Doing this input-output data collection and analysis is another way of building models. This is a field in itself. It's uh, system identification. We will not be talking about system identification in this class, but uh, uh, there will be other advanced UW ME classes that talk about this. So two classes of modeling either based on physics or based on measurement data. Okay? Sometimes these techniques are combined together. Sometimes I uh, try my best to build physical insights into the system. And then for those of the little things that I, I'm not sure about, I use data. And then I measure the response to be able to figure out. All right? Let's do one example. This is a very, this is uh, seemingly Simple, but uh, uh, the application is enormous. Just a mass spring damper. I have a mass that's connected to a spring and then to a damper. The spring coefficient is k, the damping coefficient is b, and the mass is m. The position of the mass I denote it as y. As I apply force to the mass, I can change the position. I think I can control the position. All right, so. I can do Newton's law for this system. The total force, so in this, in this example, I just have one force. So this summation sign, there's just one element, is F. The total force acting on the system is going to be equal to the mass times its acceleration. So acceleration in my notation is the derivative of the speed. And the speed is the derivative of the position. So it's m y double dot t. <coughs> right? That's the external force. I will correct my, uh, I misspoke. So the total force is, I was looking at this side only. So there is force, external force applied to the mass. And then there's action force, reaction force from the spring and from the damper. The total force is actually uh, this is trying to move the mass in the way that I want, 
and this is uh, depending on where my position is, it's either going to be helping me or it's going to be trying to go against me, right? If I define this is the way that I want to go, if I pull the mass and the damper, then they will be trying to uh, go against me. So the force from the spring is minus ky, and then the force from the damper is b times the speed, which is the velocity of the mass. So that is the model. That is the governing equation of the mass spring damper. You can move things around. I'm going to say move all the term about y to one side, and then I can get my double dot plus by dot plus ky equal to f. Okay, so f, my notation here is u, which is what we usually use for control signals. There are, of course, initial conditions about the position and about the velocity. These are set over here. So that is a model that uh, we can use. It tells about the relationship between the input u and the output y. So it's a second order ordinary differential equation, ODE. It's very important when we think about doing modeling is to ask ourselves what is our, the thing that we want. So in this example, I say position is what I want. I want to know the position of the mass. In this case, the model is this second, uh, second order ordinary differential equation. But uh, if my purpose is different, if my output that I want to control is the speed, the model is obviously different. So if the speed is the desired output, the model will be different. Be mindful about what we want when we do the modeling. OK? The semiconductor wafer scanning example is using some of the techniques over here exactly. A wafer stage, what it does in the essence is I want to be able to control x, y position of a wafer stage. And then there are uh, lighting on the top that do the projection of the light and the masks onto these wafers. So I want to be able to control the position of the mass, let's say, from, let's say in one direction first, in the x direction. It's essentially doing some of the things here. I want to be able to control the position. And then what I have control is I can control the voltage of the motor that moves this wafer. It's using some of the technique over here precisely. For most of the part, the wafer scanner, the main dynamics is a second order uh, system that tells about the response from input voltage <coughs> to motor to the position of the wafer. These parameters, they differ in applications. In this wafer, in high precision controls, usually we uh, want to minimize some of these forces that's going to go against us. That is the semiconductor, uh, one simple application of the mass spring damper system. There are other applications of this as well. Actually, in, our, in, our, in this room, I believe there should be one. So let me do a little testing. Uh, if I, okay, so there is a spring mass damper right over here. There is a spring mass, uh, there's a damper in, in this little device over here. If I don't have a spring, don't have a damper, imagine what would happen if I open the door. It would be bam, 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 right? The damper is going to help me to create a counter force uh, when uh, the, the, the door comes closer. So there's a spring inside, and then there's a damper inside. And these guys are tuned, I believe, to, to make the system behave like an uh, underdamped or critically damped system so that it doesn't have oscillations. All right. Simple, but super important. Now, another related example about modeling is, so in, in the previous example, is mass spring damper is linear motion, right? And uh, 
In practice, a lot of applications is rotational motion. Very similarly, we have Newton's second law for rotation. Instead of force, we have torque applied to a joint. And then the motion of the rotation is going to be the moment of inertia times the acceleration. It's going to be the total torque applied to it. So this is essentially F equal to MA. It's just uh, this is moment of inertia and acceleration over here. This is super important as well. In the disk drive application example, what we have is I have a rotating disk, spinning disk like this, and then I have a read right head that looks like this. My read right head is doing this rotational motion to read data over here. In practice, it's actually a little bit longer. This is called a single stage hard disk drive. I just have one actuation. I control the tip uh, of the actuator over here. Exactly using this formula, we have the net torque is going to be equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So it's going to be, by looking at this, we will be able to understand this is a second order system uh, if I treat the position as my desired output, right? So this is utilized over here. <coughs> In practice, this is just the main dynamics of the plant. Of course, if, uh, if things is as simple as this, then the industry doesn't need to spend so much R&D money. But it's building up on this concept. So in practice, they do this at an extreme scale. They not only work out the main moment of inertia for uh, the arm. So this is essentially rigid body dynamics, right? I assume the actuation here, the arm over here is a rigid body. But in practice, the disk drive industry, they just go extreme. They model like the bending moment of the arm at super high frequencies, then they all bring that model. They all bring that dynamics into the model. So in practice, it's going to be this second, uh, second order dynamics adding up to few added modes of the system. But this is applied to here precisely. All right? Now, the rotational motion, often uh, we have multiple stages. Like human arms, I have multiple degree of freedom about rotation. Modern disk drives now, nowadays is not just like this. They have two stages. To be a little bit exaggerating, uh, they have something like this. So they can control the rotation of this guy, and then they can control the rotation of this guy. OK? It's two modes two actuations built together. This concept, it just applies to everywhere. This rotational moment and uh, control of the torque <coughs> to control the angle of the rotation just happens everywhere. This little uh, the cam, dog cam is multiple rotations. And then using this technique, there is this class of robots called scalar, scalar robots, selective compliance assembling robot arm. What it looks like, it's something like this. It has a stand. And then on the stand, it has a rotating arm. It has a rotating arm. That's a one stage. It can rotate uh, this way. And then, 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 then there's another stage of robot arms. OK, so it's like uh, doing this kind of motion. And then usually we have an end factor that, 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 that works over here. Uh, it's like a gripper or something that goes perpendicular. So this is a scalar robots. As you can see, this is essentially two stages of rotation. Apply this Newton's law for angular motion twice. Uh, you can model the system. So that's the basic concept. So in practice, of course, you need to think about a lot of details. But uh, rotational motion, a lot, is utilizing this. Once we build these models, once we have an understanding of how the output responds to the input, either the model is an ordinary differential equation from the Newton's law or something else, then it is important to start thinking about what kind of general property this model has. By that, I mean these kind of things. We can classify the model into different categories just by looking at the, the mathematical descriptions. 
Let's go through this one by one by one. A model is said to be static or memoryless if the output y depends on the input u just at the current time. So y t depends only on u of t. It doesn't depend on u t minus one, u t minus two, just u t. So this is a st static system. It's like uh, y equals to three x. It's just fixed, right? It's static. So it's in contrast to dynamic systems, which is our well focus here. Dynamic systems are systems, roughly speaking, that have memories. I remember what happens yesterday. You remember uh, what happens last quarter, right? Dynamic system has memory. Mathematically, that means what happens now can be dependent on what happens in the past. So y at time t depends on u at time t, but also maybe u at other times. Right? This simple example that I talked about earlier, y equal to 3u or y equal to gamma u or y equal to gamma u plus 3, no matter how you put it, this is memoryless because yt depends only on ut. But instead, integration is dynamic. When you integrate acceleration to build speed, you use the previous acceleration, the previous performance counts. Now, very importantly, is the concept of causal or a causal system. A system is called, a model M is called causal if the output at time t, so all these indices actually matter, so be careful. So all these matter. If the y at time t depends on the input only in the past, if yt depends on u tau, tau is smaller than or equal to t. This is also in the past. This is past information. Then it's called causal. Okay? It's strictly causal if what happens now depends on strictly what happens previously. If it depends on u of tau only for tau less than t, as an example, it can be something like this. Then it's called strictly causal. This is super important. Uh, most of the systems that we deal with are causal systems. Uh, a causal systems are, are very difficult, right? If I can know like the stock price tomorrow, then uh, I'm going to be rich. I'm, I'm hopefully can be rich, but that doesn't happen, right? Because that's a causal. What I want to do now depends on what happens tomorrow. That's a causal. Causal systems are what we deal with uh, most of the time in this class. All right? So as an exercise here, I want to ask you guys, is differentiation causal? So uh, we talked about integration. Is differentiation causal? This is a causal system. But uh, what about differentiation? If y dot, no, if y of t is u dot t, is this causal or not? Okay, all right. Hope you guys have already spent some time on it. Your classmate uh, proposed the question, because differentiation, strictly speaking, mathematical differentiation, have two forms, or have uh, different forms depending on the signal. We can do this. You can define differentiation as limit yt plus delta tau minus yt over delta t with delta t go to zero, right? So this is the forward differentiation. And this is the common differentiation if the signal is what? Is continuous at uh, time t. So I meaning that it doesn't matter if you go backwards differentiation or forward differentiation, right? Look at this, then it's a causal, right? 
So because what you want to do actually utilize information in the past, even if it's tiny little bit of information in the in the in the future, then it's not causal. That is also the reason uh, in practice, right? If I want to know, so again, uh, stock market as example, this is complex system, right? If I can know the derivative, if I can know the slope of how the numbers will go, then uh, it's like I can know what the future will look like, which is not really the case, right? Differentiation defined as such is a causal, and uh, for the things that we deal with in this class is is like this. So, a causal differentiation is what we're gonna take in the class. That's the example about differentiation. Now, the perhaps the most important property for linear system is discussed on this page. <coughs> Systems can be really complex, but uh, even if it's super complex but it's linear, then it turns out the control will be much, much easier. A system is called linear System M is called linear if it satisfies this superposition property. If you do linear combinations of the input, I'm doing linear combination. I do addition or multiplication by scalars to the signal, and then I use it as my new input. If I do linear combination of my input, treat it as a new input, the, linear, the, the system is linear means the output will be linear combinations in the same pattern. So if it's multiplication of u, it's going to be multiplication of the output of u by the same scalar. And then there's addition over here. So superposition property is the most important property for linear systems. If the system works out this way, then control is easier. This has to happen for any input signals and any real numbers, alpha 1 and alpha 2. As an example, let's look at this one. y dot, this is a differential equation, y dot equals to a times y plus bu. By observation, this is linear. You can verify this by, for, uh, by, putting, by applying this formula over here. If I have y1, which is the output corresponding to y input, let's say u1, then I have this. If I have a different u1, I'm going to have a different y. So let's say I have a y2. To check whether it's linear formally, we need to do this. We need to check what is the y corresponding to input alpha1 u1 plus alpha2 u2. So this is my notation. This is corresponding to this signal over here. All right? That means you apply this input to here, to this governing equation. So apply u, make u equal to this guy, and then uh, figure out what is the output y. All right? I'm going to do this a little bit. formally over here. Because this is a governing equation, so whatever y that is the output to this input should satisfy y dot equal to a y plus b alpha 1 u1 plus alpha 2 u2. So this is the output corresponding to this input, how it is defined, right? What we want to check is whether y equal to alpha 1, y1 plus alpha 2, y2, question mark, all right? We can check this very easily. These are what u1 and y1 should look like, should be related, and this is how u2, y2 should be related. So I want to be able to create 
I want to be able to create this combination over here. So I do on this side, uh, let's say this is my equation one, this is equation two. I multiply equation one by alpha one, then I'm going to get alpha one u one, and then multiply equation two by alpha two. So I do alpha one one plus alpha two two, then this is going to give me alpha 1, u1. One. Then this is alpha 1 times the first equation plus, plus alpha 2 times the second equation. So that's how the second equation multiplied by alpha 2 looks like. Adding them up, you see, I immediately get this from the right-hand side. So what I'm going to get out of here is I know alpha 1 y1 dot plus alpha 2 y2 dot equal to alpha, I'm going to write it on the second line, equal to uh, these two added up together. So it's going to be A, I'm doing the combination uh, here into one. The two terms, I'm going to combine them into one. Right? And then these two combine together, plus B, alpha 1, u1, plus alpha 2, u2. All right? So these are the facts from, right off from these definitions of y1, u1, y2, u2. Okay? This is what they will satisfy. And I want to be able to check whether this is the case. So from here, can I, reply, can I imply these? So that's the verific verification step. So how do we verify? Uh, we can just plug this one to here. So if I plug this y equal to alpha 1, y1, <coughs> y1 plus alpha 2, y2 here, plug into here, you can see immediately I get this term out of the box, right? I don't get this term out of the box directly. I have to do differentiation to this addition of two terms. What is the differentiation of two terms added together? It's adding the differentiation individually, right? So I'm going to get alpha 1 y1 dot plus alpha 2 y2 dot. We see this is true. That's how we uh, verify linearity. In practice, uh, once we work, you, you work on this, uh, look at the definition a little bit more and work on some examples, it's going to come up very quickly to be able to recognize whether it's linear or not. What is the key step in this verification that let us know it's linear? The key step here is because these two combination terms, right, is when I lump these two up, I have this common factor A I can pull out. That is the real key over here. If it's not, if it's y1 square, then I don't get this, right? So that is quickly how you can tell whether a system is linear or not. A system is linear because these coefficients, they are all linear. These terms, they are linear. If I have anything that's not going to be uh, linear like this, sine, sine just goes up and down, up and down, right? It's not linear. You cannot do the combination step easily. So this is not linear. Okay? The coefficients in front of u is a nonlinear function of y. So this is nonlinear. That's about linear system. It's a super important property. Now, let's talk about time invariance. Okay? Let's quickly talk about time invariance. Roughly speaking, a system is time invariant if uh, its property doesn't change with respect to time. Okay? This system over here, the spring mass damper on the, on the door over here is time invariant because uh, 
it, it just the same door. Okay, it's it doesn't wear perhaps as as fast as 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 other systems. So uh, the spring is going to be the same spring, the mass is going to be the same mass, damper is going to be the same damper. So it's time invariant. Now, on the contrary, let's say uh, cars. Uh, after a long time, the engine performs a little bit differently. The tire is going to wear out. In that sense, the property of the system changes with, with respect to time. So it's time varying. OK? Quickly, uh, let me go through some examples and then talk about this definition more formally. As a concept, if look at this system, the system model contains t specifically as the parameter for u. So u is scaled differently between yesterday and today. The property, this scaling factor is different, depends on time, so it's time varying. This one, although it looks uh, complicated, although it looks complicated, but uh, the scaling is time invariant. It doesn't depend on time. So this system is nonlinear, but it's time invariant. I'll talk about how we prove time invariance uh, more formally next time. See you.